going to start. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the recording. We are live and we're ready to rock. We're ready to roll. So what we're going to do first is we're going to go over fair housing. Okay. So what I want to do is this. I want to talk about the two federal laws and some of the questions that you might get in regards to fair housing, because fair housing tends to be an area that trips a lot of people up because the questions are very situationally based. They won't come out with fair housing and ask you a straightforward question. What they're going to do is they're going to basically ask you to apply different things to scenarios and say, hey, is this discriminatory? Hey, is this legal? Is this something you could do? So you have to have a knowledge of the laws, a knowledge of the illegal practices, and then what you have to do is you have to be able to apply them to the situations. So what I'm going to do is this. We're going to go over the national laws, and then I'm going to tell you a couple of questions that you're likely to see on the exam that might trip you up, and I'll tell you what the answers, what in my opinion, the answers are going to be. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is the Civil Rights Act of 1866, right? The Civil Rights Act of 1866. So what is a, the protected class for the Civil Rights Act of 1866? What is the protected class there? Anyone that's live with me in the chat, you could answer. The protected class is gonna be race. Okay, and here's what I'm going to tell you. Race is the protected class, meaning that you cannot discriminate on anyone based on race in any time. There are no exceptions to this law. Okay, there are no exceptions to this act. Okay, so race, no exceptions, absolutely zero, none, no tolerance for that. Okay, so you cannot. So here's the thing, golden rule. I always say this. If you ever see a question where they say, is it okay for this person to discriminate on against this person based on their race? The answer is no, because the Civil Rights Act allows for there to be no exceptions. Now, something to keep in mind if you're watching this in any of the 50 states or if you're watching this um, and you have any state-specific uh, fair housing laws, every single state has different fair housing laws in regards to the state level. What I'm going to be referring to today in today's class is going to be all the federal laws, all the national laws. There might be some state laws that are more encompassing that cover different things. So that's something to keep in mind and to be cognizant of, okay? Because depending on what the question is asking you, would dictate how you have to answer it. And I'll give you like examples that you might see on your test. So the Civil Rights Act of 1866 allows for no exceptions and it protects the, the class of race. Now, the next one is the Fair Housing Act of 1968, okay? Fair Housing Act, okay? Now, this protects race, color, religion, national, okay, origin, and ancestry, okay? So you cannot discriminate based on race, color, religion, national origin, or ancestry. Now, there are two amendments that happened with this. So who remembers what the 74 amendment added? So what does what do you remember as far as the 74 amendment? Okay, anyone? Bueller, Bueller. <laughs> so that added sex, yes, so sex. OK, you cannot discriminate uh, on someone based on sex. OK, so that is how the Fair Housing Act of 68 was amended in 74 to include sex, meaning male, female. OK, so that doesn't have anything to do with sexual orientation. That has nothing to do with um, marital status, anything like that. That just has to do with sex, male, female. That's it. That was what was added in 74. Now. Keep in mind, some of your state-specific laws will cover will cover more than that. Will cover sexual orientation. Will cover different things like that. So you know, just keep that in mind because a lot of people always say that they're like, oh, you know, um, you, you know, our state laws cover um, sexual orientation, uh, marital status, all these kinds of things. It, and here's the thing: you have to look at what the question is asking you because even if they're asking you in 1968 when the Fair Housing Act was originally passed, did they what was not uh, what was a protected class? And that was a question that I saw today that someone brought up um, in a private tutoring session. They said to me, you know, and some of the answers were sex, uh, familial status, all that kind of stuff. 
And what happens is the original Fair Housing Act of 68 included race, color, religion, national origin, and ancestry. Now, something else that, to keep in mind, and, and like I said, what I'm going to be doing is uh, I'm going to be throwing out a lot of scenarios that I have seen students say are on this test and that I feel that you might see on the test. So one of them, okay, one of them that's super common is you're going to see a lot of times they will ask you about um, immigration status. Like, can an agent ask about immigration status? So everyone who's with me in the chat right now, um, as far as any of my live students, it, it is immigration status a protected class, okay? And again, not on a state level. I'm not asking about that. I'm talking federally. Federally, are um, is immigration status like can I ask someone their immigration status? Like, are you a legal resident? So, someone said I cannot ask that. So, here's what I'm going to tell you immigration status is as of right now not a protected class. You could totally. Totally, totally ask about someone's immigration status. You cannot ask their nation of origin. You cannot ask from what nation did they uh, originate. Okay, so because national origin, remember, in 68 was added. That was that was a protected class. So you could certainly ask about immigration status. Immigration status is not a protected class. Keep that in mind because they, because, and that's why I like asking you that question because I see a ton of you, you know, the, several of you in the chat typed in, no, you can't ask about this. No, you can't ask about this. You totally can. Uh, again, would, would I, would I say that that's a slippery slope in practice? Yes, I probably wouldn't advise someone to actively go out and ask immigration status unless it was really important to know. Uh, however, that is not a protected class as of 2021. Right now, it's not a protected class, so you could certainly ask it. Now, in 88, what did we add in 88? Does anyone remember what we added in 88 as far as an amendment to the Fair Housing Act of 68? What did we add? What did we add? What did we add? We added several things. We added familial status, okay? And we also added mental and physical handicaps. Now, a question came up today with one of my students and this was the question. They said, Stu, if a landlord rents to a disabled person, are they responsible to um, change, to alter the apartment? So let me ask you that question. Are they responsible? Is the landlord responsible to alter the apartment? So a couple of people are saying, no, no, no. The landlord is not responsible for altering it. Yeah. Now, let me ask you this. Does the landlord have to allow the tenant to be able to alter it? Do they have to allow them to be able to alter it? Yeah, you guys are smarty pants. Give yourself a gold star. So absolutely, that that is the answer to that question. So the landlord has to allow them to be able to alter it, but that's at the tenant's expense, and it has to be restored to its uh, original condition, okay? So that is the ADA states that it does have to make. And here's the thing. It also has to make reasonable accommodations outside of the property. So that means have to if there's a ramp that needs to be done. So if there's a ramp that needs to be added to the uh uh, apartment building or something like that, that would be at the landlord's expense. But inside of the unit, if there was alterations that needed to be made, then that would be something that would go under the responsibility of the tenant, but they would have to restore it um, in the uh, in regards to the end of the lease. So is uh, elderliness added to protected classes? That would be, so you're talking about age. Um, age would be on a state specific level. OK, um, and that would go to, you know, your state specific laws. Age, OK, is not a protected class federally. OK, but um, the uh, but what I will tell you is this in regards to 
the um, you know state specific ones. There are several states that add that in there. Um, someone asked me, will I be sending these notes or uh, so the notes basically we're, we're going to have you're going to have a recording. So a great little plug here. Hey, if anyone's watching this on recording and you're seeing all the ads and everything, go down to the links below to my site, www.helpmepassmyexam.com. And you can participate like the people who are participating with me live um, and get a link to an ad free version of this. So, yeah, Bridget, we'll be sending out a ad free version of this webinar so that you'll be able to see it. You'll be able to fast forward through it. And also, too, what happens is I check mark every single place that I'm at. So you could kind of go through the uh, webinar and you'll be able to see uh, exactly how what we've covered and uh, you could fast forward and rewind and all that kind of stuff. So that's the situation there um, because the notes basically once I'm done with the note, I erase it. So let's keep moving and grooving though. And let's talk a little bit more about the um, mental and physical handicaps. Okay. Um, so someone said, if we use fresh corn as a tool, as far as the acronym is concerned, is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. And here's what I'm going to tell you. Fresh corn also refers to a familial status, all those kinds of things. The reason I don't use that acronym and I break it down like this is because there are questions that they will ask you on the test that they will ask you the question where they will isolate the fair housing act prior to, okay prior to the, um, you know, the amendments. And Alexis said, I've never seen Ancestry. I add that in there only because some of the questions do lean towards that. Um, it's depending on your text, um, depending on your text, they may just kind of lump that in with national origin. Um, but I have seen some break it down to Ancestry, like the Dearborn text that I mainly teach out of will use Ancestry, depending on the author. So again, what you also have to realize too, is you might have received information, you might be reading information from your school or your instructor that differs from what I say, or you might say, oh, Stu, I never learned it that way. And that doesn't mean that that way isn't good okay because understand that a lot of the questions you'll never be asked like straight up what is this okay you have to take your knowledge and apply it to a scenario they'll give you scenario based questions so what happens is this um a lot of the times if you have a good enough knowledge about what it is then you could apply that to the scenario so that's why i mentioned national ancestry in there only because sometimes people don't understand what national origin is and they don't understand um that ancestry could be included in that so that's kind of like um maybe like a hyphen kind of thing but i've seen text write that out so that's why i always kind of do that too so um, also what I would say with mental and physical handicaps, something else that you want to make sure that you know, is that AIDS victims were explicitly included in this. Okay. And the reason why AIDS victims were explicitly included was because you have to think about the contextual clues as far as the time frame. We're coming off of the AIDS epidemic of the eighties. Okay. So what happens is they specifically included, um, AIDS victims in this so that you had a situation where, you know, you weren't discriminating against someone because, I mean, if you lived through that time, you understand exactly what it was like. Um, and if you didn't, you know, obviously go back, read through history, you'll see AIDS victims were something that were very highly because of the virus and how it was set up. It was something that um, to be honest, it, it was uh, something that they were being discriminated against in many different scenarios. That's why they explicitly included them. So there would be, um, I've seen a question on the test that has to do with, can you disclose to um, a prospective buyer that a um, homeowner had AIDS? And no, because AIDS victims are explicitly a protected class. Now, let me ask you another question. Um, alcoholics in treatment, alcoholics in treatment, are they considered a protected class? Tell me in the chat. Yeah, so Bridget said, yeah, absolutely they are. So alcoholics in treatment are considered to be a protected class, correct. So now what if they're an, an illegal substance abusers, okay, drug addicts, okay? Drug addicts, are they a protected class? Okay, because I see. Um, so what I will tell you is this, and I'm going to give you my opinion, okay? And there's some instructors that may differ with me on this. However, I'm going to give you my opinion, which has been, um, I've cross-referenced this with several attorneys as well as several other real estate instructors. As far as the textbook is concerned, okay? And I'm talking textbook, your test answers there. Okay. I'm not talking practice. I'm not talking about, you know, could they be considered in certain situations? I'm not talking about that. 
drug addicts, even in recovery, are not considered to be a protected class because they consider alcohol to be a legal substance. If you are doing illicit drugs or illicit uh, substances, then you are considered to be criminal activity. And again, I'm talking for your test. They're going to look at it as criminal activity and they will consider that to be illegal and they would consider that to fall under criminal. And although you may be suffering from uh, addiction, same as an alcoholic, they are not going to be considering you a protected class. And again, leave it up to discussion, all that kind of stuff, however you feel in regards to that. Um, I'm telling you what you need to know in regards to passing your exam. Now, let me go into another scenario. So what is, I'm going to put a new text box over here. Um, what is steering? What is steering? What is steering, everybody? Because they'll ask you questions about this where you'll have to identify this in a, in a question. So steering, and I always hate using the, uh, I feel like my first grade teachers are probably rolling over in their graves if they're, if they are in their graves right now. Um, otherwise, they're, they're probably have their ears ringing right now. Um, I, I know that it is wrong to use the, uh, you know, uh, use the word in the definition. And a lot of you probably do that. You're like, oh, steering is steering someone to an area. Okay. Um, what I always say is I use the word, I try not to, because like I said, my first grade teachers would probably be rolling over right now. Um, I, I try to say that it's channeling someone or directing someone to a certain area to or away from a certain area because they belong to a protected class. Okay. Because they belong to a protected class. Now it's totally fine if they say to you, Hey, I want to move to this area. And let's say that it's stereotypically, they would be like, Oh yeah, no, you totally belong in this area because this is a highly like Bridget said in the, in in the in the chat you know jewish to jewish area yeah if you said it's a you know if if someone said i want to live in the jewish community i want to be here you know that's fine but if they don't have a criteria and then you steer or di you direct them you channel them to something um so um and then uh latika asked the question um so, the, and I was going to get to this one too, because this is a common question actually, and I'm going to, um, uh, I, I wanted to address it. And I'll tell you the definitive answer because I've seen it written many different ways, Latika. And I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly too. So, and I apologize if I didn't. So the, the question is this, if an ad is taken out, per, if an ad is taken out in an Asian newspaper, is perfectly acceptable, but as of late, PSI is asking about the Russian neighborhood only, is not acceptable. My school, Weikert, said it's acceptable. Um, sorry, I wanted to ask this specifically. Yeah, so let me talk about this. So there's a question on PSI national exam that has to do with an agent is advertising. And I don't know if it's an Asian newspaper, Russian newspaper, but highly um, you know, geared towards one specific demographic that would be considered a protected class. And the question goes like this. So here's the, the litmus test I have for this question. If the agent limits, okay, or eliminates. So you have to decide if they are totally eliminating all other advertising and just advertising in the Asian or Russian newspaper or website. If they completely eliminate all other advertisements and only advertise in an Asian or Russian website or newspaper, I would consider that to be unacceptable because they are only advertising there. However, if they limit, reduce, are, but are still advertising elsewhere, I would say that's acceptable. And I think that's why your school might have said that it's acceptable because I think that the language that they're assuming that the test is giving you is that they are limiting, which is one of the ways I've seen it written. They are limiting the amount of advertising elsewhere, however, not completely eliminating it. So that's that's the answer there. If they completely eliminate it, I have issue with it. I would say it's discriminatory. If they say on the test that they're limiting it or reducing it, and but not eliminating, then I would say that it's fine. It's acceptable. Okay. So as long as no discriminatory um, wording is used, and yeah, you will see that on the test. Promise you, cross my heart. Okay. Um, so uh, that is a big question. Always comes up. So thank you for asking that. I appreciate it. Um, and I was actually going to get there eventually um, because that's why I always go over fair housing because I think that you guys get a lot of questions on that. And I think this is where you can get really tripped up. So steering is directing or channeling a buyer to or away from an area. What about redlining? What about redlining? 
What is that? What is redlining? So redlining has to do with lending. So everyone always gets the lending part, right? Everyone always gets the lending part, okay? Lending is when you, um, you know, is when you run into a situation where you are not lending to um, to uh, certain people in a certain area. So you're drawing a red line around um, certain areas, okay? You're drawing a red line around certain areas and you're not lending or insuring, okay? So not lending or insuring. So we'll put that in there, lending slash insuring to certain people in certain ge geographic areas, okay? So that's the key there. It's a geographic area because what happens is you're drawing a red line around something and that is what that is. Okay, last one. It's going to be blockbusting or panic peddling, also known as panic selling. I also refer to it as panic selling sometimes in certain questions. So blockbusting or panic selling, what's that? Or panic peddling. So this is, and keep in mind too, all these things that I'm showing you up here, those three, those are illegal, okay? Just in case you guys were like, in case one of you guys were like, hey, are these legal? Are these not legal? What's the story here? So they're illegal, okay? No bueno. Um, so the question is this, um, blockbusting is sell your, yeah, absolutely. Latika, you hit it right on the, right on the, uh, the nail on the head it's a blockbusting is sell your property because these people are moving in. also these people are moving out right um i actually in um i was originally from brooklyn and i had several investments in brooklyn and um my neighborhood was predominantly white italian and they were like oh they you know like agents were calling me up like they didn't know my background they were calling me up and saying you know all the italians are moving out of town you really should sell now while you still have that and i'm like whoa hold up can't do that. Naughty, naughty. You know, I mean, even if it's true, it was, you know, my whole entire block, literally when I grew up there, okay, um, it was all Italian. Literally, my grandparents spoke Italian down the whole block, and then it changed to um, highly, my area changed highly to Russian, Asian, um, that kind of thing. But it, it was, it, we were still making great money or selling the properties there. Um, but as far as an agent is concerned, even if it's true, you can't induce the fear in someone and say, hey, this protected class is moving in or moving out um, or, you know, to induce a sale. So that's the situation there. Yeah. So Tika said steering is for buyers. Blockbusting is for sellers. Absolutely. Great way to remember it. Absolutely. So let me ask you this, guys. So we spent a bunch of time on fair housing. Do you guys have any other questions on fair housing that I haven't gone over yet? Anything going once, going twice. Awesome. So what I'm going to do is erase, erase some of this stuff, okay? And that, and I also like to keep some of my notes up here just so that you have it, uh, so that you can see it on the screen, so you can pause, rewind, take notes yourself, okay? So keep that in mind, okay? So erase, erase. Done there. And let's put a little. Let's go to the next one. Why don't we go to? Um, why don't we go to our environmental issues? Because some of you have had some questions on environmental issues. And I think that it's important for us to address a couple of them. And I'm going to go over the biggies, which are, and I, I consider them the big three, lead-based paint, asbestos, and radon, okay? So I always like talking about those three, because other than that, I think that you really won't get a question. I don't really see you getting a question on underground storage tanks, things of that nature. Those are more in practice, really good things to know. But as far as are those important things for you to remember for your tests, probably not, you know. So I'm going to do the big three. So let's talk about asbestos. Okay, so what is asbestos? Who, who knows what asbestos is? Asbestos. Um, and, <laughs> and I'll make you laugh a little bit. Hopefully I'll make you laugh. If not, you'll, you'll be like, ah, oh, let's do that. Really corny joke. Um, asbestos is basically the, um, the Frank's red hot of construction and insulation, uh, for, uh, the, like back in the day, this was literally the preferred method of insulating, um, back in the day, it was the Frank's red hot. They put that on 
everything. So this is an amazing insulator. Amazing. It, I will refer to it as a magical insulator because it really was. I mean, they put this on everything. They put it on siding, roofing. They put it in tiles. They put it, they wrap pipes around. They wrap pipes in it. And now what happened was this. They, 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 when, when we advanced, uh, you know, as far as our understanding of what certain chemicals did and what, and we got information as far as the long-term effects on some of these to our health, we started to learn that asbestos was not a good thing to breathe in. There's a property that um, that the asbestos has, which called which is called friable. Okay, so and, and friable spelt f r i a b l e. Friable basically means that something is crumbly. Okay, um, and when it becomes crumbly, it kind of poofs and it becomes um like uh, airborne in, in the air. So what happens is this: asbestos, if left untouched, okay, if you do not touch it, it's usually fine, a okay. Like there's there's usually nothing wrong with asbestos. Okay, so if you see a home with asbestos, that doesn't mean that you automatically have to clutch the pearls and go, we must remove it. Okay, and that's the thing that I want you to understand. So there's two things about asbestos that you could be asked on a test that I would say are the most common. Okay, um, the situation is this. Okay, um, the uh, the property it has that makes it hazardous is that it's friable, okay? So if you disturb it, if you touch it and it crumbles and becomes airborne and then you ingest that into your lungs, that's the very bad part, okay? But if left untouched, it's a-okay. It's not bad. It will not do anything if you don't touch it, okay? So the property that, that asbestos has is that it's friable, okay? Um, so the situation is this in regards to the test. And again, keep in mind, I am telling you what the test is going to ask you. I'm not talking about the practice. I'm not talking about what I would advise clients to do. I'm talking about the test. So friable, okay, is the property. The other thing is the remediation that the test will look for is encapsulation, okay? Okay encapsulation because and here's why and i'm going to explain it to you they will ask you a question potentially on the test about what is the preferred method of removing asbestos and the preferred method if it is available is encapsulation because keep in mind i just told you guys that the the reason why asbestos is hazardous is because it is friable and if disturbed it could potentially become airborne, and that is what causes the health hazards, okay? So what happens is if it is an option that is open to you, they will always recommend that you encapsulate it, which means that you basically safely, basically put another layer around it so that it will never get out because then here's the logic at the test. If you disturb it, that creates the potential to have it become airborne. That's it. That's that is the logic there. Again, that is not my practical advice. That is not what I would recommend in every single situation. But I am telling you the way that the test logics it logics it out when it comes to asbestos. Okay. So those are the two things. Property is friable. Encapsulation would be the preferred method for a um for the uh, remediation of it because that limits the amount of disturbance that there would be okay so let me ask you this question guys do you have any questions about asbestos right now before i go on to the other two uh environmental hazards that i would tell you guys that you could see on the test Anything else? Nope. Good. So let's go on to lead paint. Yeah, lead paint is going to be houses before 1978. So if it's built 1978 or earlier, seller needs to disclose um, the any records, knowledge, or information about lead paint in the home. Now, typically, here's what's going to happen. The sellers will typically, and I'm talking about for the most part, they will typically say, I have no records. I have no knowledge. Okay. Like if I sold 10 homes that had, uh, that, that was built 1978 or earlier, um, I would probably say eight of them will say we have no knowledge. We have no records. Okay. Um, now there are some that might say, Hey, yeah, we do. Okay. And what happens is the buyer is entitled to another thing that's important with lead paint that sometimes I think certain schools kind of skip over 
is they have a 10 day inspection. They have a right to a uh, uh, right to 10 day inspection period. Okay. For the buyer. Okay. And they could choose to waive this. The buyer could choose to waive this. They could say, yeah, no, 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 then we're fine. We don't need to inspect for lead-based paint. Some buyers will want to test for lead-based paint. Now, lead-based paint, another thing that you will be tested on, okay, typically, and I've seen this now on the test too, is um, it most hazardous to children, okay? So they'll ask you what substance is the most hazardous to children, and the answer to that is lead paint. Lead paint is the is the one that has that causes the most neurological, the most um, the the most health concerns for people um, uh, under age. Okay, so that is the situation there that they might also ask you. Um, also, too, they'll ask you if like a contract might be void or uh, voided because there's they didn't sign a lead based paint disclosure. No, the buyer could still purchase the home. Okay. Um, the buyer could still purchase the home and go forward with it, even if the seller does not uh, disclose if they have records, do not have records. Because again, the uh, the seller, the buyer has the right to basically, um, you know, waive the inspection period, have the inspection period. Um, but it doesn't make the contract like, okay, yeah, you can't go forward with it if you don't have the lead-based paint hazard um, disclosure filled out. No, you could. It's just the seller has to, like, they could be held liable for that if they aren't disclosing that. And even if they even if they don't have knowledge, they should just put it down on a piece of paper and just say, hey, we don't have knowledge or records. So that is the two. The last one is radon. So what is radon? What is radon? What is radon? So radon is a colorless, odorless, uh, naturally occurring, and I think that's something that you really need to understand, naturally occurring, um, radioactive gas, okay? Not fast gas. <laughs> so, um, so radon system, so Alexis, are you talking about the radon system? The, um, the, the that was uh, $2,000, yeah. That's, so here's the thing: radon systems are not um, are not necessarily super cheap, um, but they're super effective and they're super simple to install. Um, so what happens is this: basically, you know, a lot of people always ask me. They say, "Stu, if radon is naturally occurring out in the world, right? Like you're like Stu, this you know, radon is just out there, okay? Then why aren't we getting sick from it? Well, the reason why we don't get sick from radon is because when we are just walking around the world, um, what happens is radon is never in a concentrated area, okay? When you build a structure on land, when you build a structure on land, what happens is this, the radon actually starts to build up and become concentrated in a certain area. So what that basically means is this, um, the high concentrations of it, the concentrations that you actually um, would start to see uh, issues or health issues from is going to be 4.0 picocuries or higher. So if it's 4.0 picocuries per liter, and if you ever want to sound intelligent to your buyers or sellers, that's the number, then what would happen is this. Basically, what they would do is they would put a PVC pipe, literally a PVC pipe, into the ground, the lowest uh, portion of the house. So usually it's in the basement, the slab, something like that. And then what they do is they vent it out to the side of the house. There's a fan in that system. And what happens is the fan just blows the radon gas out to the side of the home. That's It's literally that simple. It's really not that difficult in regards to setting up, doing all that kind of stuff, and making sure that the radon is remediated. So that is exactly what radon is how you remediate against it, all that kind of stuff. And actually, it's almost like foolproof. It's almost like one of those things that once you do it, you don't have to worry about it anymore. So are there any questions, concerns, burning desires from anyone who is with me live in regards to our um, the, the three environmental issues that I would say are super important for you to know about? Like Those are the ones that I would say, if anything, you need to understand and know about. Anything? Peanut gallery? Nothing. Good to go. I'm going to erase you, erase you then. Okay. So let's talk about 
and I always like talking about this. Let's talk about real versus personal property because I think that there are several questions that you get on the test um, that you will see that are real versus personal property. So what I'm going to tell you is this. First, let's identify this. Let's identify land. So what is the definition of land? And I'm going to draw an earth here. And this is my little earth, my little, little thing right there. So that's the earth, okay? I'll give him a smiley face, the earth, and we'll put a little water here, all this kind of stuff. So put water, and then I'll put a little land over here. And what I'll do is this. I'll also put this little V. So this little portion of the earth, okay, is the land that we're going to be referring to. So land is, okay, anything that is naturally occurring, okay? And it's anything that's naturally occurring on the surface, okay? And that is land. Land is that. You also have mineral rights. You have air rights. So when you own land, okay, you own all that. You own the air rights, the subsurface rights, the surface, anything that's naturally occurring. So we'll add a tree here. Okay, that's my tree. Don't make fun of my drawings. <laughs> so now what's the difference between land and real estate? Well, real estate, you're going to have a little house right over here. So real estate is the land and any improvements to the land. So let me write that down for you. So the land is the surface, okay? Subsurface and air rights, okay? That's land, okay? Then real property or real estate, okay, is going to be uh, land plus improvements, okay? Land plus improvements, okay? And also this is, and land, I would say anything naturally occurring, okay? Natural growth, okay? Like trees, stuff like that, all right? I would say that's land. Real property is the land plus any man-made improvements on it, okay? Now, let's talk about real property versus personal property, okay? So define personal property for me, guys. Tell me what personal property is. What is that? I see, I see someone said personal property is movable. Yeah, so here's the thing. Typically, personal property is 100% movable, okay? Typically, typically it is. Um, something, a, a question that they do like to ask on the test is this, and I'll ask you guys, and let's see how smarty pants you are. You ready? Um, the key to a home, so the key to the front door lock of a home, is that personal property or is that real property? Is that personal or is that real? Tell me in the chat. Curious. Curious to see what you guys say. Ooh, someone said real property. So the key to the front door is real property. Yeah, so here's what I'll tell you. The key to the front door is 1,000% real property. Even though it is movable, it's attached by law to that door lock, okay? It's, it's attached due to functionality to that door lock. So that's the situation there in regards to, you know, like a tricky question they might ask you on the test. And keep in, like, you know, um, keep in mind a lot of what I say, a lot of what I say, especially in these, especially in all my videos, I'm teaching you things to help you understand the stuff for the test. So all of my examples, everything I do is geared towards the test, okay? That is literally, listen, if you're watching my videos and you're in my classes and you're in all this stuff, my goal is to help you pass the exam. That's it. There is no ulterior motive that I have here. So I want you to understand that to the core of what I do, okay? So Atika asked a question, said, had a question about chandeliers. I heard that if you're using nuts bolted, it's a fixture like blinds. So let's talk about this for a second because I think that's a really actually a great segue because let's talk about what a fixture is, okay? So a fixture is an item of personal property, okay? That has been converted into real property. Okay. So let's talk about this and let's talk about the different legal tests of a fixture. So here's what I'm going to tell you. Okay. Very important. When we're talking about fixtures, okay, you need to understand the legal tests of a fixture and what that means for um, your, uh, for, for the question that's being asked of you. Okay. For the question that's being asked of you, you have to understand um, 
what they're talking about when they're talking about the fixture. So they're going to give you different examples. And what I want you to do, I'm just erasing my earth, okay, is understand the legal tests of a fixture. So this is what a court would use to decide if something is a fixture, okay, which means that it's an item that was once personal property, but now has been converted into real property. So it's called Maria, and that's method of attachment, okay, okay, adaptation of the item to the real estate, relationship of items to the parties attaching it, and then um, the uh, intentions of the parties attaching it. And agreement. So let me kind of take you through this and give you a couple of examples. So Latika asked the question, um, what about uh, chandeliers, right? What about chandelier? Um, chandelier, let's talk about that. Let's run it through the legal test of a fixture. And I'm going to show you how I apply the legal test of a fixture to help um, the uh, help you understand if it's a part of the real estate or not, okay? So legal, legal fixture, you ready? The... Um, method of attachment if it is wired into the home i say that it's attached okay the adaptation of the item to the real estate i would say that the chandelier has adapted it is now a part of the real estate and the fact that it is lighting for the room that it is in relationship of the item to the parties unless it is like an heirloom or has some sort of unique relationship to the parties then it's it it, it, it there's no unique relationship so if there was then we might not consider it. It might not pass the legal test of the relationship of the items to the parties. Intentions of the parties attaching it. Well, if I put a chandelier up in that room, absent me having some unique relationship to it, the assumption is that that's the chandelier for the room. And then agreement. Now, this is where it gets a little tricky because absent any agreements, okay, and this is why that is last, if there is an agreement where you say, hey, look, that chandelier is not real property, it might look like a fixture. So you might get to the M, the A, the R, the I, and say, yeah, no, that's totally a fixture, and then get to the agreement and go, yeah, um, Mr. Buyer, no, that's not co that's not staying with the property. I paid X amount of money for it, or you know, that was a wedding gift from somebody else. That, that would be a situation where the relationship to the items of the parties would be unique, so it probably wouldn't get past the R. Um, but chandeliers, personal property, I mean, excuse me, real property fixtures, you know, I, I would consider them that, and that's how you apply the legal test of a fixture. So do you see, so with Tico Alexis, do you see how, um, that works? How I literally take that, 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 um, uh, legal test of a fixture and I apply it to the chandelier situation and where do you see where there might be differences too in that? Like if the question was worded a little differently where I could use that and say, okay, let me run through the legal test of a fixture. Um, so, um, the question on PHI is which one is personal property, the heirloom rose bush hot tub or uh, chandelier. So the heirloom rose bush is the one that, uh, of course, that's a popular question. I get asked that about a hundred times a week. And if you actually go back through some of my other videos that I've done on this, um, I probably have five or six different videos on this. The heirloom rose bush, I would say is personal property. When you're giving me three choices of the heirloom rose bush, hot tub, or chandelier because hot tub is uh, is wired to the property okay um is attached um the heirloom rose bush the reason i say that's personal property is because i'm reading the word heirloom and keep in mind i do not know the exact answer to this question i do not know what the intentions of the author was i'm reading heirloom rose bush as that it's a family heirloom OK, not that it's a type of rose bush. I'm reading that it's a family heirloom and that is what it is. Now, that's my answer to it. So I would answer in that one when given three choices of heirloom, rose bush, hot tub or chandelier that the heirloom rose bush is personal property. Again, I might be giving you the wrong answer, but that's how I'm reading it. And I'm giving you my logic behind the interpretation of it. Um, and that's the best answer that I could give you because I've also consulted with many people on that question. And that is also how they read it as well. So I'm giving you my methodology behind it and also how you could, because here's the thing too. The reason I spend a lot of time on this is because you do get confusing questions on the test about this. And what I'm trying to do is give you examples, show you 
the, 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 the legal test of a fixture and then showing you how to apply it. So not only am I explaining to you the methodology behind how I get to an answer, I'm showing you how you could take this, take your understanding of it and apply it to different questions so that you could be successful in those questions. Does that make sense? You know, I'm, I'm kind of teaching you how to fish. <laughs> So um, I'm glad that you got that one. That was uh, because, again, that is definitely a big one to me. So that is the difference between personal property and real property. And also the last thing that I'm going to tell you, another question that you may see on your test, but have to do with the conversion of something from real property to personal property. OK, and also what an emblemment is. So first, I'm going to tell you that they might ask you a question where they ask you to kind of follow the bouncing ball. They love saying okay, there's a tree on the property. Is it real or personal property? I would refer to that as real property. Next one, we chop down the tree and we have the lumber from the tree. Is that real or personal property? Well, it's detached from the property. So I would say that it is um, now personal property, right? It's movable, right? That lumber, I could take it. I could go to my mother-in-law's and start a fire pit, <laughs> okay? Um, now, I then use that lumber to build a deck on the property, okay? Now I've converted it back to real property, okay? And the last thing that I want to go over is what an emblemment is and what a trade fixture is. So what's an emblemment? And let me ask you that question, guys, for those of you who are here with me live. What is an emblemment? And I'm going to put it right up here. An emblemment. What is that? So that is an annual crop, okay? An emblemment is an annual crop. They also refer to it, they'll use a fancy word called Fructus industrials. And let me explain what fructus industrials is. Okay. Fructus industrials. Okay. Fructus industrials is basically it's Latin for, okay. This is where I get to flex my smart muscles and show you kind of like a little bit of what's going on. Um, fructus industrials actually means fruits of industry, meaning that these would not bear fruit without labor added to it. So the in the absence of labor, okay, in the absence of labor, that these would not bear fruit, okay? So annual crops do not bear fruit without labor added to them. Something like, um, let's say, an apple tree, a berry bush, things like that, they would be referred to as fructus naturals, meaning that they naturally bear fruit, okay? So like if I had an apple tree and it was healthy, everything was fine, it, it, it rained ample enough. Everything was fine. The apple tree was there. It would bear fruit without me doing anything. It would yield me apples next year if I literally sat there and just said, okay, cool. I have an apple tree. Does that make sense? We good on that, guys? And the last thing that I want to ask you is this. What is, what is a trade fixture? What is a trade fixture? What is a trade fixture, okay? Because an emblemment, keep in mind, that is personal property. So the right to harvest the fructus industrials or the crops, those are personal property of the tenant farmer, okay? Now, a trade fixture. What is a trade fixture? That is something that has to do with commercial use. Yeah, it's something used for a business like a dentist chair or a barbershop chair or, or a sinks and basins at a nail salon. They love that example. They love that example. So what they do is they like asking you questions about that where something might seem like, also another question that I got on the test was um, bolted down freezer. Okay, bolted down freezer, that's that at a grocery store. That is going to be trade fixtures. So what, what they do is the government views and the way that the law works is that they view those as personal property of the business, meaning that those items are going to go with the business. As long as the business, when they vacate the lease, take the items with them and restore the property to the way that they found it, similar to like the ADA, um, the disability situation, the handicap situation, that would be considered a personal property of the business. So that's it. That's, that's real property versus personal property. So guys, do you have any questions on that? Questions, concerns, burning desires, anything? Did I answer all the questions that you've seen on the test? Did I answer all the questions that you um, have seen in your practice exams? Is there anything that I've been missing? Because I think I hit on all of them. Nope. All right, let's keep going. So the next one that I want to cover is 
I want to go over finance. Okay. I want to go over finance because I think that finance is really one that, you know, people don't understand certain nuances, certain things. So my first question to you guys is this, what is a mortgage? So that is always where I like to start. What is a mortgage? Okay. What is a mortgage? What is a mortgage? So a mortgage is this. A mortgage is a pledge of real property. So it's a pledge, okay, of real property uh, as repayment to secure repayment of a loan, to secure note slash repayment of a loan. And I'm going to explain that to you. Just give me one second, because what, what people always get is this, okay? They always get confused because they think the money is the mortgage because we use that slang. We use that real estate slang, I call it, where you say, oh, you're going to get a mortgage, okay? N no, buyers don't get mortgages, okay? Buyers don't get mortgages. They get a loan and then they give a mortgage. They pledge the real property. Okay. So watch this. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to draw some stuff for you. I'm going to tell you my example. I'm going to explain it the way I explain it. So hear me out. Here is a bank. Okay. So we'll put walls up and we'll put money in the walls. Okay. So this is the bank. Okay. And here we have a happy little buyer that comes along and goes, I want to buy this little house over here. Um, Mr. Bank, could you give me some money? So here's what happens. The bank gives the money, okay? And it's a lot of money, okay? So they give the loan, and we'll call that a loan, okay? So they give a lot of money out, okay? Then they say to the borrower, hey, um, you're, are you going to pay us back? We really want to make sure that you pay us back. So here's what happens. The borrower says to him, okay, we're going to – I'm going to give you a note, okay? I'm going to give you a note, and the bank goes, hey, what's a note? So guys, let me ask you this. What is a note? What is a promissory note? So when the borrower gives the bank the promissory note, like, what is that? What is that? So here's what it is. The promissory note, the promissory note is this. It is evidence of debt, okay? Okay. It is evidence of debt. So it's an IOU, okay? The note is an IOU. So here's the thing. You can have, and just so you know, you can have a promissory note or a note for almost anything, okay? So like if you wanted to give someone a promissory note right now and say, I owe you 50 bucks, like you could totally do that, okay? It doesn't have to be to um, for uh, a, a mortgage, okay, or deed of trust. And keep in mind, if you're watching in different states, your state, you might be like, oh, our state doesn't do mortgages. Our state does deed of trust. It's a little different way to secure a note, um, but same mechanism, almost used interchangeably, okay, depending on what state you're in. So that's why I'm going to explain a mortgage. However, just keep in mind that if you are in a state where you use deed of trust or you've heard of trust deeds, it, it, they basically could be used interchangeably. They're just slightly different. And something that I'll tell you guys, um, for everyone watching, bottom line is this. A door, deed of trust or a trust deed and a mortgage, you do not need to know much about them as far as the specifics of certain things and how they work and how the mechanisms all work. So you don't want to overstudy. You don't want to look at these questions. You know, you don't want to spend six hours studying a day and try to get an in-depth knowledge or a knowledge beyond what you need to pass the exam. Because a lot of you guys unnecessarily search for a much more detailed version of what you need. So my little stick figure version of what you of what I'm telling you right here, this is what you need to pass the test. If you understand my simple explanation, you will be more ahead of the curve than you will be behind the curve, okay? So keep that in mind. So what happens is this. The bank now has this IOU from the buyer, okay? The bank now has this IOU from the buyer and they say to the buyer, 
yeah, I don't trust that you're not going to pay us back. So they kind of do a meh face. They're like, I don't trust that you're going to pay us back with this. So we need to secure this note. We need to make sure that you're going to repay us. So the borrower says, I totally get it. I'm going to give you a mortgage to my house that I just bought. Bought. So the mortgage is pledging the real property as collateral for the loan. Basically, that would be like me saying to someone, let's say I said to Latika, like Latika borrowed, uh, you know, let me borrow a thousand dollars. And I was like, oh, here, I'm going to give you my IOU. I owe you a thousand dollars, Latika. Now, Latika's like, yeah, this isn't good enough because I don't trust that you're going to pay me back. So I was like, okay, you know what? If, if I don't pay you back, you could sell my fountain pen collection. Okay. And, uh, they way more than a thousand dollars, but I'll let you sell my fountain pen collection. Okay. Um, so that's basically me pledging that as collateral. Um, <laughs> so let's see, cause thanks dude. That's awesome. <laughs> well, thank you for the thousand dollars. Um, so that's basically the mechanism, how it works. And now for those of you who might be in a deed of trust state or trust deed state. So the difference between a mortgage and a deed of trust is that in a mortgage, the person, the borrower, actually retains possess, uh, um, the legal the legal title to the property, okay? So they hold on to it. It's like it's theirs, okay? So they're just saying to you, hey, if you need it, come get it. Like, I'm, I'm letting you put a lien on the property. In a deed of trust, what they do is they actually say to the borrower, hey, you're going to give legal title to this third party. They're going to hold it. So like I would basically, so like if I'm using the example of me, Latika, and the $1,000 loan in my fountain pen collection. So if it was a mortgage, I would keep the fountain pens at my office. And then if Latika was like, hey, you haven't paid me, I'm going to come take those now. Okay, I'm going to sell them. I'm going to sell them all. All right, my wife would be terribly happy. <laughs> but um, yeah, that would be uh, the example of a mortgage. Okay. And then if I was doing a deed of trust or a trust deed, what would happen is this. It would basically be like, um, you, Latika giving me the $1,000, me giving the IOU, and then Latika going, okay, you know what? Uh, Kim's going to hold all the uh, hold those fountain pens. So Kim's a third party. Kim's going to hold all those fountain pens. Um, so that is the situation. So... Um, yeah. So what would happen is basically Kim would be the trustee in that situation. She would be holding the fountain pens as collateral. Okay. So that is a the situation there. So do you have any questions on that, on what a mortgage is? Because that's, that's literally how like a mortgage deed of trust, all that kind of works. Um, and, and here's the thing you only really need to know the basics of what I just told you, like what, what I, if you remember what I just told you in regards to what a mortgage is, that's it. Also the process of mortgaging your property is referred to as hypothecation. So you might see that big word come into play. Okay. So that is the situation there. All right. You don't need much more than what I'm telling you. And that's why keep in mind too, um, when you're studying for stuff, I don't want you to overdo it. Okay. So let's look at the next one. What is, and I'm going to ask you this. So what's an FHA loan? What is an FHA loan? What is that? What is an FHA loan? So it is a federally backed loan. Yeah, it is a federally backed loan. So the FHA, so what does the FHA do? Okay, so like, let, let me ask you that question. I think that, that might be a, an even better thing. So the FHA says, stands for the Federal Housing Administration. And people always think it stands for fair housing, right? Um, and what they do is they insure loans. So the FHA insures loans, okay? So here's what happens, okay? The FHA loans were originally um, created to um, allow people who might not have a lot of money OK, who might not have a lot of money, who might not have an opportunity to experience the wonderful beautifulness of homeownership. Like it allows them to uh, get because what they do is the FHA loans are typically do not um, do not have situations where they require a ton of money down. OK, um, and they do not require people to have an, a higher than a regular um, credit score. So Watika said they guarantee the lenders at the buyer defaults. They don't guarantee them. They insure the loan. 
They insure the loan. They insure the loan. They don't guarantee it. Okay. So they insure it. All right. It does. And it does offer a level of protection for the, um, for, for the lenders. It's the reason why they're, they're like, okay, sure. We'll, we, we'll take as little as, um, as, uh, you know, uh, three and a half percent down. So Tika asks, not even VA, VA does guarantee. Okay. So that's, so here's the thing. FHA insures VA guarantees. So, um, FHA, and actually here's what happens is, uh, the situation is this, um, the FHA. So that also they'll ask you, Hey, does the FHA lend money? No, they don't lend money. Okay. Um, the FHA simply insures lenders so that they, it basically entices them to, um, lend money to these people who might not have a lot of money and might also have uh, lower credit scores, but that's not always the case. Um, just so you know, like there's people out there, like right now, um, there's some FHA programs that are as little as like 2.7% interest. Okay. So really crazy stuff out there. Like I would want an, an FHA loan right now, if I could get one. So yeah, keep that in mind too, that, you know, FHA is not necessarily always, going to be for um for people who are looking to get um you know uh you know that, that are like credit challenge or don't have a lot of money there's some people that might have a lot of money they're like you know i'd rather go with fha because the programs right now are really good so that's the situation between an fha loan so what about a va loan we kind of said a little bit about what a va loan did well at least what, what the function of the va is okay so va loan what do they do what does the va do and they guarantee loans okay to uh, qualified veterans. And I say qualified veterans, okay, because not every veteran qualifies. There's certain qualifying markers, and I won't go into those because you won't be tested on them. But a couple of things that you will see with VA loans. The VA does guarantee loans, okay, and that allows for the lenders to uh, lend up to 100% financing, okay? It allows them to lend up to 100% financing on um, these uh, these VA loans. And now here's what happens too. VA loans are also assumable, okay? But the, the veterans can only have one VA loan out at a time and they have, to, um, they, they have to live in the property. So you can't do it for investment properties. You can't just buy an investment property with a VA guaranteed loan, okay? Um, also something else that happens too with VA guaranteed loans um, that I want you to be aware of is this. Okay. They have what's called a CRV. Okay. And that is basically the appraisal for the VA loan. Okay. They just call it something different. And the CRV is referred to as the certificate of reasonable value. So basically what happens is this. Okay. Um, so they, they will always have um, a CRV or a certificate of reasonable value on a VA loan. And that is the appraisal. So Atika asks question. Um, so FHA has low financing for three and a half percent down compared to no down payment requirements for VA. Yeah, that's definitely an accurate statement. So FHA um, has uh, low down payments as opposed to the VA, which could, you could go all the way up to 100% financing on that. Yeah, that's definitely it. So now let me ask you this last question in regards to the different um, loan types. What about a conventional loan? What is a conventional loan? This is actually the easiest of all of them. Okay, this is actually the easiest one. Anyone have any idea? Do, do, do. So conventional, here's what I'll tell you, is not VA guaranteed uh, or FHA insured or government backed. So what happens is this. Conventional loans are always going to be not FHA, not VA, not government backed in any manner, shape or form. So there's like USDA loans that you might be able to get like agricultural loans. And here's the thing. Um, I, I'm not going to go into those because as far as what I've seen on the test, I have not seen either a um, Pearson um, a, either a Pearson um, or PSI test have that those as questions on there. So Latika asked, so it's a higher mortgage interest compared to the federal. Not necessarily. It depends. It depends on the situation. Right now, FHA is a very, they're very good programs out there. Um, it, it really depends on 
the scenario and the markets and a lot of the things going on. So I think that it would be unfair to uh, categorize it as um, always higher interest rates than the other ones. And let me ask you this. Let me just give a, a general definition of what interest is, because I think that's important too, because I think that on the test, they have been asking that. So what is interest? What is interest? How would we, like, if you had to give me a simple definition of interest, what would that be? Okay. What would the simple definition of interest be? So my simple definition is this. Interest is rent on money. Okay. Okay. When I pay someone interest for lending me money, okay, that is basically rent on the money they owe me, okay? So that's the situation there in regards to that, okay? It's rent on money, okay? Um, FHA cannot be used for million-dollar properties, right? Yeah, there's going to definitely be a cap there. And here's the thing. I don't want to that, – that really goes into the thick of it. Um, what I would say is this, if that's a question that you're thinking is going to be an important one um, for your test, I would say nix that out of your head. Um, because again, what you have to understand is this, there's, and, and this is a, one, of the one of the traps that I kind of get sucked into as an instructor, as someone who's very passionate about this, okay, as someone who loves doing this, I could get into scenarios, questions that really get into the thick of things and really get detailed. Um, but I kind of have to use some reserve and kind of hold back and be like, no, I got to really just tell you what's going to be surface level for the test. And a lot of the stuff that, and that's why another reason why I tell you guys do not overstudy because then you start asking questions that just kind of go down into a rabbit hole. And like I said, instructors like myself, um, you know, really, we, we love what we do. So what happens is if you come to me with a really crazy question, like, I sometimes get excited and I'm like, oh, yes, I would love to answer this question because it's fascinating to me. However, I, I also understand that um, kind of going into that is not helping you because you're, that's not something that you really need to know for the test. And that's why I do stress um, not overstudying. And Alexis said, I think I overstudy and you keep it to the basics is where I get confused. Yeah, because here's what happens is, and I have a, I have a sign in my office and I always tell my students this. And it, listen, so for those of you who are listening to this and you're saying, hey, well, you're, you're getting into the thick of things right now. I think that's really important for a lot of you to hear this because this goes to your study habits and everything else. I have a sign in my office above my desk that say stupid people pass the test. It's the truth. Like you, you, you can laugh about it. Um, but bottom line is the, the person who comes in and, and passes the test, there's two reasons people get a question wrong on the test and understand this. One of the reasons someone gets something wrong on the test is they don't know the information. Okay. They just flat out don't know it. And then they have a 25% chance of getting it right. Okay. And then someone overthinks it. So I could ask you a question. What color is the black cat? And let me show you two people who get it wrong. Someone who goes, Stu, what's a color? Fundamentally, you don't understand the question. Totally get it. You have a 25% chance. Then the other person is like this. Ah, I know these questions are tricky. There's no way it's that straightforward. The answer is orange. <laughs> so now I have a student getting it wrong because they just come to the question with the notion that this is going to be difficult and that you're trying to trick me. So that's why I say to you guys, do not do the overstudying and the overthinking. Uh, that's really the best piece of advice I could give you. Like if you take anything away from this, that really is one of the best pieces of advice. Now I'm going to ask you another question. Ready? So we answered what a mortgage is. We answered a VA, FHA, conventional. Okay. We answered what interest is. Something else that you guys get asked on the test a lot. What is a point or, uh, or a discount point? So what is that? What is a point or a discount point? Anybody want to answer that one? So here, let me tell you what that is. And um, when I ask you a question, I take a little se second. I'm just taking a quick sip of water. Okay. <laughs> Boom. Alexis, 1% of the loan. Yes. Yes. Is 1% of the loan. That is a correct statement. Okay. So whether we are talking about a point for origination fees, a point for whatever, or a discount point, no matter what, a point is 1% of the loan, 1% of the loan, 1% of the loan, not of the sale price of the loan, 1% of the loan, okay? Let me reiterate that, 1% of the loan. So 
when we're talking about a point just in general, we might be talking about like origination fees, things like that. Okay. That's when we would run into a situation where it's 1% of the loan and it's probably for origination fees, like to cover a, um, you know, loan officer's costs or, you know, like uh, making sure that they make money on this. Okay. So that's sometimes something that you have to pay depending on the program that you're in, or you might want to pay a discount point, which is basically going to be discounting the amount of the, uh, the interest. Okay. So you're discounting the interest, All right. That would be something that a discount point would be set up to do either way. It is 1% of the loan. So now that we got that done, let's talk about something else. Let's talk about title. Love title. So title to a property, there's several different ways that we could take title to a property. So what is title? What is title? What is title? Anyone want to tell me what that is? So title is ownership, right? Because think about it, you have ownership. So like if you have title to a car, right? So you have title to a car, you have ownership to the car. Now, what happens is this, it, cars are a much different thing because cars, there's really title to the car is title to the car. So one person owns it, one person gets it, one person has it, that's it, done, kibbutzkis, okay? So we understand title in a situation like that when we're talking about a car. However, when we're talking about real estate, there are several ways that you could take title to a property, and that's what makes it confusing. That's what makes it um, something that's a little more difficult than something straightforward, like I have title to the car. So here, this is what the story is. Um, so that is the situation there in regards to uh, title. It's a little more complicated. So we're going to go through each of the different ways in which you could take title to a property. So there's tenancy and severalty. Now, some of you might say, oh, they called it, um, you know, uh, they just called it severalty in my class, or they called it, um, you know, uh, title and severalty or something like that. There's several different ways. Again, what I'm going to tell you is this. Just like with the acronyms, when you guys were asking me in the chat, hey, my instructor used this. I mean, they use fresh corn. They use this, that, and the other. I always like giving you my logic, what I like to do, how I like to refer to it. But one of the reasons why I always say to you guys, um, you should be um, basically introducing yourselves to different ways of explaining things. And that's why I, I like, you know, that you guys come on with me, you come on with other instructors, you probably watch other YouTube videos, I encourage my students to do that, so that you get to understand the different ways in which questions could be asked and the different wording and things. So tenancy and severalty is one owner, okay. And this could be individual or business entity, okay? This could be an individual or business entity. So when I talk about tenancy and severalty, that's what I'm referring to. I'm referring to one owner, okay? And they could own, and it could be an individual or a business. Now, something else that I do wanna say is this, okay? Um, a lot of you guys say, oh, but that kind of confuses me, Stu. You just said severalty. So I'm thinking several, like I have several bags of Skittles in the secret drawer in my desk in my office. Yes, I have a secret drawer with a bunch of bags of Skittles. <laughs> so what happens is this. Um, if I said I have several of something, that means I have multiples of something. So I don't understand. Why is it one person? Why is it one individual? Okay. Um, so here's what I'm going to tell you, okay? Um, the, uh, the situation is this, okay? The um, severalty means severed interest. So if I sever myself from the rest of the world, I have severed interest, okay? I have severed interest in regards to uh, that. So that is why it is one owner. You have severed interest from the rest of the world. The next one is tenancy in common, okay? Tenancy in common. So what is tenancy in common? This is multiple people, okay? Or businesses. So multiple people or businesses can own it is tenants in common. They have the right to devise. So what does devise mean? What does devise mean? What is what is that word? That's that's a, that's a very that's a word that you'll see definitely on the test. Like one million percent, you'll see that word on the test. Okay, devise means to will real property. 
okay? To will real property, okay? So you have the right to devise, and it allows for unequal shares of interest, unequal interest in property, okay? So those are the two common things in regards to um, tenancy in common. And I'm going to just uh, space this out a little bit, make it a little bigger so that it makes it a little easier for you guys to see. So that's what we're talking about there. So tenancy in common allows for multiple people. So we're talking more than one, okay? And you have the right to devise the property and it allows for unequal interest in the property. Now, the um, last one that I'm going to go over in regards to the, the common ones is going to be joint tenancy, so joint tenancy is more than one person, not business, okay? Businesses cannot own property as joint tenants. You must have the four unities, okay? And we call them TTIP, um, time, title, interest, and possession, okay? So you have to have the four unities and you get what is referred to as the right of survivorship, Okay, so what is the right of survivorship? Anyone who's live with me in the chat right now want to tell me what right of survivorship means? So the right of survivorship is going to be this. Ownership dissolves into the remaining owner or owners of the property, okay? So what happens is this, when you have joint tenancy, okay, um, yeah, the other owner gets the property, not your heirs, right? You cannot devise the property. That's why you must meet the requirements of the four unities, and you must declare joint tenancy. Understand that joint tenancy is not a default. It is not assumed. It will not be created by what we refer to as operation of law, meaning that it's just assumed or, okay, it's automatic. It is never automatic because the government never says automatically that you give up the right to devise or will the property. Okay. You have to declare this. You have to say, I want joint tenancy. I meet the requirements of joint tenancy, and I want that with the person I'm buying the house with. Now, here's how I remember this, my crass little way of remembering this. Tenants in common, usually that's common people to one another. That would be like investors, things like that, where you would want to make sure that your family gets the property, right? Your heirs, your children get the property, okay? Joint tenancy, basically those would be people that I would probably more than likely share a joint with, okay? These are people that I'm like, okay, if I die, I have no one else that I would want to have the property other than you. Now, let me ask you another question. This is where people get tripped up and this is where the tests will trip you up, okay? This is where the tests will trip you up. My question is this, can you, as a joint tenant, sell or transfer your interests while you're alive? So type that in the chat. Let me know. I'm curious to see what you think. So you ready for this? They 100% can and will be able to... Um, add any type of people to the uh, to, to this. They would be able to t transfer their interest, sell it, um, do whatever they want while they're alive. As While they're alive, they can do that. But what happens is anyone that would come in, so let's say I'm going to draw a little scenario. Are you ready? And this would be like a scenario that you would get on test. A, B, and C have met the requirements of joint tenants, and they are joint tenants, okay? So A, B, and C are joint tenants. Now, C sells their pro sells their interest to D, okay? So here's what would happen in that scenario. D, and then I'm just going to make it a little different color. D and A and B would be tenants in common, okay? A and B would remain as joint tenants, OK, they would remain as joint tenants because what happens is this. So if A dies, B gets their interest. If B dies, A gets their interest. And then they would be tenant in common with D. OK, so that's literally the situation. They will give you questions like that 
on the test. They will give you questions like that on the test where they will kill someone off. They will sell an interest. They will devise. They will say all these different things. Follow the bouncing ball. Be very careful of what they're saying because you will get questions like that on the test. 100%, 100% of the time. Okay, guys. So be really conscious of that. If they do not meet the four unities of time, title, interest, and possession, um, that is the situation. So Watika asked a great question, a great segue question. Um, can a husband and wife always be tenants in entirety? So here's what happens. Tenants entirety, and this is the reason why I don't have it up there. Not every state recognizes tenancy by the entirety, okay? Tenancy by the entirety is essentially the same as joint tenants, because the benefits are the same, it's rights of survivorship, but it's basically the four unities, okay, plus marriage. So I'll put like a little ring here with a, a diamond, plus marriage, okay? Um, so that is, and I'll put little sparkles around it, and there we go, plus marriage, okay? So you have to have the unity of time, title, interest, and possession, and marriage. So what is the added benefit of that? There is none. It's just a different way to take title to a property if you are married, okay? So um, community property would be where states, certain. that's again, another state specific thing, community property, okay? Um, that's an operation of law that's covered in California has community property. There's a couple different states that have that. Um, so again, what I always say when it comes to marriage and what happens with married couples, I always say defer to your state specific material in regards to that understand either community property tenancy um, by the entirety, okay? Because tenancy by the entirety is simply joint tenancy. It's, it's the same, okay? Community property, I do not particularly teach in, teach state-specific material in places where community property is active, but that is an operation of law that I would recommend that you read through that if your state covers it. If your state doesn't, then don't worry about it, okay? Don't worry about it. So let's keep going. Let's keep moving and grooving, okay? So, yeah, and I try to make sure that you understand because what happens is this. I have a lot of people who watch me and I have a lot of people that I work with and I don't know what state everyone is in in regards to, uh, you know, um, my webinars and all that kind of stuff. So I try to be super conscious of the words that come out of my mouth. The stuff that goes on the paper is always good for national. And I always kind of put that red light up if I tell you guys, hey, defer to your state specific material. Okay. So definitely do that. And um, what I'll tell you is this, I'll put in the chat. Um, I think that, so what I'll do is I'll put in the chat, a book that I do recommend um, for state specific stuff. So depending on where you are um, and I'm going to actually look for it right now, because it actually is uh, it's, it's a really good um, book. I'm going to put a link in here for this person called um, Stephen Metling writes a book and I'm actually going to, um, like I said, copy the link. I'm going to put it in with the chat for people who are with me. But if you're not, just look up Metling spelt M-E-T-T-L-I-N-G and your state um, and look up the exam prep. He writes a really good book. I actually know him personally, a very good author, very cognizant of what's going on. And his book is very easy to understand. So if you are going to plug money into something, um, that's definitely a good thing to uh, do. And I think I just put the um, one that I had the quickest up there for, which was New Jersey in my, um, in my links. So I just put that in my chat. But if for those of you who are watching live and you're like, hey, I don't see the link, um, just type in Metling, M-E-T-T-L-I-N-G, and type in license exam and then your state. He may or may not have a book for you. Um, but if he does, I definitely say invest in it. Okay, that's minimum. So let's do this. Let's go over to deeds. Let's talk about deeds. So, guys, what is a deed? What is a deed? I think this is really important. And I like talking about this right after we talk about um, title because they, they kind of go hand in hand. The reason why we need deeds is because title is kind of interesting and different in um, in real estate. Like title is not is not clean cut, right? So what is a deed? So a deed is this, and I'm going to write it down here, okay? A deed is evidence 
of transfer of title. Okay. So of title. Okay. So what I'll tell you is this. Let me, let me ask you like another question. You ready? If I have a deed to a property, okay. If I have a deed to a property, does that mean I own the property? So does that mean I own it? I'll put a little meth face. Does that mean I own it? Hmm. That's a good question, right, Stu? No, Alexis just said, no, it doesn't mean that you own it, right? Okay. Um, well, let's say my name is on. So well, TK asked the question, what if my name is on it? So yeah, I mean, my name would probably be on it if I had it, if I had a deed, right? So the answer to that is no, no, because not all deeds are created equal. Not every deed makes the guarantee that the person giving you the deed has ownership. So let's talk about this for a second. So the first type of deed that we want to talk about is that warranty deed. Okay, that warranty deed. And that basically says this. A warranty deed says, I own it and will defend against all claims. Now, let me explain to who says I own it. Okay, that's the grantor. The grantor is saying, I own it. The grantor is the one who is giving the deed. Okay, so we would identify them as either the seller, the one who is transferring the ownership. So the person who is giving the deed is the grantor. Remember, OR gives, EE receives. So if we're talking about any scenario where you see OR, they are giving something. So grantor is the term we would use in a deed to identify who is giving the, the, the deed. So the, the grantor is making the guarantees. And that's the difference between each and every single deed, okay, um, is the guarantees the grantor makes. In a warranty deed, most coverage for the grantee the grantor is saying, I own it and will defend against all claims. So you're probably asking yourself, Stu, what's a claim? Because a lot of my students always ask that because I use that kind of freely. And I just basically, sometimes I assume that you guys know what that means. But let me clarify it before we go any further into any other uh, definitions of what a deed is. So when I'm saying I will defend it against all claims, that means that if someone else came and said, hey, I have ownership to that property. Hi, hi, I, I own that property or I have an interest in that property, then what happens is you could say, as the holder of a warranty deed, you could say, nay, nay, you do not. I have a warranty deed. And if that is a genuine problem where they might actually have a genuine claim, the grantor that gave you the deed to that property needs to remedy it and they need to defend your ownership. Okay, so that is why a warranty deed is the most encompassing. Now, here's the thing, is that common is that common? No, <laughs> because they're basically saying, I will defend it against all claims going back to the beginning of time. I will defend it against all claims that happened during my time and any claims into the future. That is craziness. That is not something that I would say typically would normally happen, okay? So that is the situation in regards to what a warranty deed is. But here's the thing. This is, goes back to one of those things that you need to know it for the test. <laughs> so even though these things, will you ever see them in the real world? No, but you need it for the test. You have my 100% permission to forget it the day you pass the test. Up until then, you need to know it. <laughs> so the next one is a special warranty deed, okay? A special warranty deed. The grantor is saying, I own it and will defend it against, and will defend against claims during my time only, okay? So... Here's a great question that Latika asks. If you don't record your deed and the grantor sells the same property to another who records it, who has ownership? Um, great question. So basically the question is boiling down to this. Does a, um, is a deed valid if it's not recorded? The answer to that is yes, okay? A deed could still be valid if it's not recorded. You do not need to record a deed for it to be valid. So if someone records a deed after you, so let's say that the uh, grantor gives you a deed and meets the legal requirements of a deed and the legal requirements of a deed, I didn't go into that one, 
but I'll just put them really quickly right up here is you just need to have, and I'll actually put it right over here. You need to have signature of grantor, of grantor. You need to have um, delivery and acceptance. You need to have a legal description of land, of land. And you need to have also a, um, the granting words, okay, and the habendum clause. And what that is, is basically um, just a clear definition of what type of, um, how you're taking title to the property, um, what type of freehold estate it is, all that kind of stuff. So the reasons why um, the, 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 the deed is needed basically it's because you have to have granting words. You have to have all that kind of stuff. That's really honestly the truth of it. So Bridget asked property address, that would be legal description, legal description. It's like a super address, right? So if you have a legal description of land, then you're definitely going to have a situation where you could have, um, you know, the legal description of land, you're basically going to not need an address because you have the legal description of it. So that's why that's needed. So yes, the property address, and just so you know, the property address would not suffice as legal description to land. The only three legal descriptors to land are meets and bounds description, lot and block, or the plot, recorded plot of survey, and a government rectangular survey system. Those are the only three ways you could legally describe land on uh, a deed. So that's the situation there. So two fantastic questions, okay? Thank you for that, because that helps me um, know where you are as far as your knowledge base is concerned and how I could help clarify some things for you. So thank you for that. Um, so the special warranty deed, this is the most common in like a purchase and sale. Um, they basically say, I own it and I'll defend it against any claims during my time. And how I remember special warranty deed is I always say my time with the property was special to me, okay? So that's how I remember special warranty deed. So let's keep moving, let's keep grooving, let's go to the next one, which is bargain and sale deed, okay? So what is a bargain and sale deed? Does anyone know what a bargain and sale deed is? So a bargain and sale deed, the grantor is saying, I own the property, but will not defend. OK, they will not defend it against any claims. OK, so when the heck would you want to get a bargain and sale deed? OK, or when would you get a bargain and sale deed? Well, that would be a situation like a REO or bank owned property. OK, bank owned properties, you almost always, always, always get, um, you know, uh, a bargain and sale deed because the bank makes the uh, makes the um, uh, clarification. They say, hey. We um, we own the property. We have legal title to the property, but we will not defend it against any future claims of um, you know uh, of superior title. Where someone says, "Hey, I um, I own the property, right? You know, I, I have uh, a right to the property." They'll be like, "Yeah, no, we're not going to defend it against that." Because think of it this way: the the bank owned properties. They don't know what happened with the property. All they know is that they took the legal steps, the proper legal steps to um, get title to the property. So the only thing that they will make as far as a guarantee to a grantee, um, so uh, so that would be the situation there. So Latika said someone willed a deed to the Brooklyn Bridge. Would that be a bargain and sale deed? Um, probably not because they would have to make the grantor would be saying that they do have title to the Brooklyn Bridge. And I'm assuming <laughs> that you're basically saying, hey, um, they don't own the Brooklyn Bridge. So in that situation, then the grantor would be on the hook for the fact that they say that they're saying they own it. Because keep in mind, you know, in, in a bargain and sale deed, they're making the they're, they're, they're saying I own it. So if they're if they're giving you the the a bargain and sale deed, they're guaranteeing that that they at least have title to it, but they're just not saying that someone else might not have another claim to it or there might not be any encumbrances on it. There might not be anything else that you would have to know about that, right? So that's the situation there. And then the last one, I'm going to go with the last one, okay, so that we round it out. It's a quit claim deed. Okay? And they're saying I may or may not own, and I will not defend, okay? So you're probably thinking, why the heck would you want to use that, okay? 
why the heck would you want to use that? So situation is this. Um, whenever you see someone do a quit claim deed, that's typically like a divorce situation. That's typically a transfers between family members. Okay. That's typically the scenarios that you would see um, a quit claim deed occur. Okay. You would see that in those scenarios. So here's the thing. I could give you a quit claim deed. So Bridget, I could give you a quit claim deed to Bruce Springsteen's house in New Jersey. Does that mean you own the property? No. That means that you have whatever interest Stu had at the time that I signed that, that deed over to you. Okay. So if my interest is absolutely bubkiss, then what you have is a paper that says that you officially have bubkiss. <laughs> so that's what it is. It can meet all the legal requirements of a legal valid deed, but basically it's just a deed that says you own nothing. Okay. So that's the situation there. So do you guys have any questions, concerns, burning desires in regards to any further knowledge that I could shove into your head um, with that? So Alexis said the least protection. Yes, absolutely. That is the least protective for the grantee. Okay. Least protective. So we went from most protective to the least protective. So what I want to do is I want to round out um, tonight's webinar with um, – does anyone have so here's the here's the question that I will ask you guys who are here live with me. Which one do you want to go to? We have contracts, agency, and appraisals. We will not be able to get to all three of them. It's an impossibility. Okay. But my question to you is this: I will let I will take a vote. I will take a vote. I, agency was the first one I saw. So guess what? Fast fingers win. Speed wins. So agency it is. Um, and I have two votes for agency. Bam, let's do it. So agency, okay, let's talk about the general law of agency. Let's talk about what agency is, because I think that that's super important to understand and to know, okay? So agency is when someone, okay, represents or works on behalf of another, okay? So that's agency, okay? In a nutshell, if we just have to give it just a general kind of like, you know, one little blurb, okay? That's the blurb. And understand this too. Um, a lot of what I recommend that you do is that you understand a concise definition of the words, okay? Concise, simple definitions. The simpler your definition is, the better you're going to be in regards to being able to unpack it and apply it to different scenarios that you will come across on the test, okay? That's very, very, very important for your success, okay? Very important for your success, okay? And, and I think that that's something that you really want to make sure that you understand in regards to this. It is very important for your success to um, make sure that you have, okay, that you have a good, basic, simple definition of a lot of different words. Now, let's talk about the different types of agency that you would have. We have universal, general, and special. Okay. And what I'm going to do is this, I'm going to tell you what my definition of each one of these is. Then I will give you an example of one. Okay. So universal agency, the agent has universal representation of the client, meaning it's usually power of attorney. Okay. So this is usually going to be power of attorney. Okay. So I have power of attorney over my grandparents. That means that I could go pick up a prescription medication for them. That means that I could sell their house. That means that I could sign a lease for them. That means that I could buy a car for them, okay? I don't think you want my 95-year-old grandfather driving. However, if I wanted to buy a car in their name, use their money in their bank account, I could definitely do that, okay? So that is power of attorney. That is exactly what that is. Next one, general agency. So general agency, and listen to what I'm about to say. You have universality within one business aspect for the client, okay? You have universality within one business aspect. So a good example of this is property manager, okay? So listen to what I say. So in universal agency, you have universal representation of the client outside of um, the, uh, you know, outside of any one particular business aspect. So you could, like I said, do almost anything for the client or principal, okay? The property manager in general agency, so watch this. Let's say Bridget was my property manager for property A. She has universality at that property, meaning at property A, she could go 
find a tenant. She could go advertise. She could go fix a plumbing issue. She could go hire someone to fix a roofing issue. If we need a van to drive some of our um, tenants to uh, medical appointments, let's say most of them are elderly, she has the authority to go do a lease, sign all that for the business, okay? She's my property manager there. She has universality there. She does not have the right to go pick up my medical prescriptions, go do anything else that a universal agent would have. So again, she has universality within one aspect or one business aspect of my life, okay? So basically that means that there's gonna be more than one thing that she could do and or be responsible for, okay? If that makes sense. So the last one is special agency. And this is typically where real estate agents come in, okay? So if I take a listing, okay, for 123 Main Street, and 123 Main Street comes, uh, you know, has a, a leaky roof, okay? Am I responsible for going, hiring a roofer and paying for the roofer and then making sure that everything's taken care of? Is that my responsibility? No. I am strictly, as a listing agent, supposed to find a buyer. That's it. I am finding a buyer, okay? I am finding a buyer. That's all I'm doing. I'm not doing anything else. So that's why you must understand that. I am not doing anything but figuring out what the, um, what was I going to say? But figuring out where I can find a buyer. That's it. That's my only task. I'm only doing one thing, okay? So I do not have any type of universality. Now, something else that's important to understand, okay? Um, yeah, so to find a ready, willing, and able buyer. Absolutely. You know, on the seller's terms, all that kind of stuff. So excellent, excellent, excellent. Now, Let's talk about the fiduciary responsibilities, okay? Because we refer to an agency relationship as a fiduciary relationship. So the fiduciary responsibilities, okay, that one would owe to a client. And that's going to be, I use the acronym old car, okay? Some of you might use other things. I think old car is the most encompassing, okay? And that is obedience, loyalty, disclosure, uh, confidentiality, accounting, and reasonable care. Okay, those are the ones that I say that we owe a client. So an agent owes a client those, okay? An agent owes a client those, okay? Meaning that that's what they're going to owe the the um, the, the uh, individuals in regards to someone who is listed as a client or principal. Now, I'm using those terms interchangeably. They are interchangeable. I treat them as synonyms. I do not treat them as anything less than synonyms. They are synonyms to one another. So when it comes to understanding agency, principal and client are going to be interchangeably used with one another. Now, let me ask you this. What is a customer? What is a customer? How do I identify? How do I know someone who might be a customer to me? Okay. Okay. Who is going to be a customer to me? So that would be someone, if I'm representing the buyer, that would be the seller. So it would be the third party in the transaction. It would be the third party in regards to the, tra the real estate transaction or any kind of transactions where you're representing a party. Okay, the other party, the third party um, is going to be that of the customer. Now, let me ask you this, as an agent, do you owe anything to the third party? Do you owe anything to a customer? So Latika said yes. So what do you owe them? Honest and fair dealing is what you owe them. Yes, 1 million percent. So you wouldn't owe a customer, so the third party, the full set of fiduciary responsibilities. You would not owe them old car, okay? You would owe them just honesty and fair dealing. And that's usually how they would word it too, okay? So they would word it as such. So that being said, that brings us to the end of tonight. What I'm going to do is I'm going to stop my recording, okay? So anyone who's st stuck with me with the recording, thank you so much for hanging with me um, and have a fantastic night.